Uh, good morning, folks. Welcome to Bedford Community Church's online service. Uh, today's call to worship comes from Psalm 66, verses 1 through 4. I'll be reading from the ESV translation. The Word of God says this, Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of His name. Give to Him glorious praise. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds, so great is your power that your enemies come cringing to you. All the earth worships you and sings praises to you. They sing praises to your name. Uh, friends, wherever you are today watching this, listening to this, would you join us in worship? Before we do, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this time and this space to worship you. God, as we sing songs to you, as we hear from your word, God, would you minister your spirit to all those who hear. God, I pray that you would get all the glory through our worship, all the praise through our worship. And God, would you draw all men and all women closer to you, God, throughout this service. Thank you again for this time. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. I count on one thing The same God never fails When I fail me now You won't fail me now In the waiting The same God who's never late Is working all things out You're working all things out Yes, I will lift you high Lowest valley, yes, I will bless your name. Oh, yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy. Oh, my days, yes, I will. And I count on one thing the same God never fails will not fail me now you won't fail me now in the waiting the same God is never late he's working all things out You're working all things out oh yes I will I'll lift you high in the lowest valley yes I will bless you name, oh yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy on oh, my days. Yes, I will for all my days. Yes, I will. I choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names. Nothing can stand against I choose to praise Glorify, glorify The name of all names Nothing can stand against I choose to praise Glorify, glorify The name of all names Nothing can stand against I choose to praise Glorify, glorify the name of all names. Nothing can stand against. Oh, yes, I will I'll lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Oh, yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy.
cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior that cursed tree Body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still and all. Welcome to Bedford Community Church. My name is Deanna Pastor, and I'm the Director of Growth Groups here at BCC. We're so glad you're with us. Here are this week's announcements. 
Hey, BCC family, I'm excited to let you know that we have scheduled the physical healing prayer service. It will be on Friday, August 25th at 7 p.m. And it will include worship, a lesson on what we believe about physical healing and why we believe it, and a time of anointing and the laying on of hands. I encourage you all to come, either to receive prayer or to provide prayer for our brothers and sisters in need. Thank you, I look forward to seeing you there that evening. Well, hi, I'm Melissa Cancro, Director of Children's Discipleship here at BCC. And this is Michelle Evans, she joins us today. Um, so Michelle, you're one of our volunteers at Children's Discipleship. Can you tell us where you serve in Children's Discipleship? I serve kindergarten and first grade. And uh, how long have you been serving? A couple months now. So what is your favorite thing about serving in Children's Discipleship? Uh, the kids, their honesty is so real and they teach me so much, even though I should be teaching them. And what would you tell somebody who may want to start in Children's Discipleship, but are a little nervous about it? Just jump right in. The kids are so welcoming and warming and they just want to hang out with you. So if you'd like to serve, we're looking for um, in our fall for teachers and helpers. So if you'd like to serve or come find out what we're about, please email me, melissa at bedfordcommunitychurch.org or see me in the halls, stop me in the halls. Thank you. Hey friends, we are so excited to participate again in September Fest. On Saturday, September 9th, we're gonna set up a table in downtown Mount Kisco, provide some fun activities at our table, meet some new friends, and invite them to BCC. It's gonna be a great time. Now, we're looking for some volunteers who can help at the table and, you know, chat with some folks. If you're interested, please reach out to me at the service or send me an email at danny at bedfordcommunitychurch.org. Left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right. Oh, hi, you caught me preparing for our Armor of God camp, which is August 28th through 30th at 9 a.m. through 12 p.m. right here for kids in kindergarten through fifth grade. We already have 24 kids registered. There is no better way to prepare for a new school year than to put on the armor of God from Ephesians 6. So here's my ask for you. Invite the kids in your life. The registration link is on the BCC website under events. Pray for the kids that are coming and the volunteers and volunteer to help. We still have spots for crew leaders and helpers. So see me or email me at melissa at bedfordcommunitychurch.org. Registration ends on September 18th. Thank you. Friends, we are so thankful for your generosity. Your giving funds all of the ministries here at BCC. We believe that God is our source for all things and our giving is an act of worship. If you would like to give, there are four ways to do so online on the BCC website, on the BCC app, through the mail, and in person. Thanks for joining us today. Make sure you stay connected with us throughout the week, online on our website, our app, Instagram, or our YouTube channel. Enjoy the service. Hey friends, my name is Danny Chung. I am the Director of Outreach and Engagement here at BCC. And uh, today is week two of our Summer Leadership Symposium. Now, right now, we're having a focus on redemptive leadership. Uh, we're doing a deep dive into the book of Ruth. Sarah, Pastor Sarah kicked it off last week by looking at chapter one. Today, we'll cover chapter two, and we will look into this whole idea of servant leadership. So, would you join me as I read from today? Uh, I'm going to be reading from chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, and I'll be reading from the ESV translation. The Word of God says this, Now Naomi had a relative of her husband's, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him in whose sight I shall find favor. And she said to her, Go, my daughter. So she set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the clan of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came from uh, Bethlehem. And he said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered, The Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his young man who was in charge of the reapers, Whose young woman is this? And the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, She's a young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, Please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. So she came 
and she has continued from early morning until now, except for a short rest. Verse 8. Then Boaz said to Ruth, Now listen, my daughter, do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young woman. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should, have, that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? That's the word of God. Would you join me in prayer? God, your word is truth. God, your word is life. God, I pray that as we dive deeper into your word, that you will breathe life into us, God, as we read, study, meditate on your word. God, my prayer is that you will do everything you want to do in us today so you could do everything you want us, you want to do through us for your glory, for your fame. Thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Friends, have you ever flown on Southwest Airlines? Now, if you have, uh, you probably know firsthand that it's very, very different from most of the domestic airlines we have here in the United States. Now, there are two things that are very, very unique and special about Southwest. One, you can't reserve your seats ahead of time. Uh, they, their whole thing is you wait in line at the airport and it's first come, first serve. Now, I went on the Southwest website and it said this. It said, quote, enjoy the freedom of picking any available seat upon boarding, end quote. Uh, I like how they worded that. Now, I don't know about you, but personally, there's nothing enjoyable about that experience, okay? I mean, if you travel with a family, you know exactly what I'm talking about, right? Um, they actually have a thing where you could pay a little extra money so you can cut ahead closer to the front of the line so you can get better dibs on seats. And the second thing that's really unique about Southwest is this, is that all the seats are the same. There's no first class, no business class, no economy class. It's just all the same. It's one big economy seating throughout the entire plane. It's no frills. If you look at that picture right now, there's no media screen in front of you. You can't watch videos. You can't watch TV shows. can't watch games. They don't serve any meals during their flights. It's very, very basic fare. Now, loyal customers love Southwest for two reasons. One, their airfares are usually much cheaper than domestic competitors. And two, they have phenomenal customer service. In fact, year after year, among all U.S. airlines, Southwest's customer service ranks near the top, mostly ranked number one in customer service. And probably the most impressive stat about Southwest Airlines is that they have unparalleled financial success. Uh, they are the only domestic airline to ever have 47, check this, 47 consecutive years of profitability. No domestic airlines can even come close to that. That streak was broken in 2020 because of this tiny little thing called COVID. I don't know, maybe you heard of it. Um, how do they keep doing that? How do they keep making money? How do they keep their customers satisfied? Like, what is their secret sauce? It's this, servant leadership. Hear what former Southwest Airlines president Colleen Barrett once said about their corporate philosophy of servant leadership. This is what she said. She said, we say that at the top of our pyramid, in terms of the most important priority that we have, it is our employees. I spend 85% of my time on employees and on delivering proactive customer service to our employees. If I do a good enough job of that, and if my fellow peers do a good enough job of that, the employees, in turn, spend their time trying to assure that our second most important customers to us, that's our passengers, they feel good about the service that they are getting because they're getting proactive customer service delivery." Unquote. 
So, from the top of the corporate ladder, they are focused on meeting the needs, serving the needs of their employees so that the employees can meet and serve the needs of the customers. Servants who reproduce servants. So what happens when a no-frills airline continues to reproduce servant-minded employees? Well, they continue to receive the highest customer satisfaction marks and people keep coming back and they keep on making money. That's the power of servant leadership, friends. Now, servant leadership works not only in the corporate setting, but it also works in every part of our lives. It works in our home, our family relationships, our romantic relationships, our friendships. If you lead a kid's sports team, if you lead a local community group, etc. Today, we're going to do a case study on servant leadership by looking at Boaz and Ruth. Now, when I look at Ruth and Boaz's life, I see three markers of a servant's leader. And it's this. One, servant leaders, they believe, they really believe in caring for others. Two, servant leaders really believe in generosity to all. And three, servant leaders point people to the perfect servant leader. So, let's start number one. Servant leaders believe in caring for others. Last week, Pastor Sarah, she spoke on the first chapter of Ruth. Now, let me just do a quick little recap, all right? There is a famine in the land of Judah. Naomi, her husband, and their two sons, they leave their homeland and they go to a foreign land called Moab to find food, to survive. And what follows is a series of just extremely heartbreaking events. First, Naomi's husband, Elimelech, he dies. Then Naomi's two sons, they marry Moabite women, and 10 years later, both sons die. So in a very, very patriarchal society, to be a widow and have no husband, no male heirs, that's a really difficult spot to be in. So Naomi, she makes a decision. She's going to go back home to Judah. And she tells her two daughter-in-laws, hey, I want you to go back home and start your life over afresh. So one of the daughter-in-laws, Orpah, she listens and she goes back. And the second daughter-in-law, Ruth, she doesn't. Now, Ruth had two options. Uh, it was choose personal comfort, look out for me, or to care for another. Now, personal comfort, what was that? It looks like this. It's stay in Moab, go back home. You see, returning to her family, it represents acceptance. It represents provision, security. So to stay in Moab, to, to be with her family in her homeland, it's familiar, it's predictable, it's safe. Listen, can we be honest? Who doesn't like familiar, predictable, safe? Now, this is what Naomi wanted for Ruth because there was no guarantee of that back in Judah. So that's option number one, right? Choosing your personal comfort. Now option two for Ruth was this, care for another, which meant travel to Judah with her mother-in-law, Naomi. Now, this is where I believe I have to point out something that the author of the book of Ruth is trying to make. He tries to make very clear to the readers in chapters one and the beginning of chapter two, he mentions something. Four times, Ruth is a Moabite. Now, it seems kind of like overkill, don't you think? Like, why does the writer keep emphasizing this point that Ruth is a Moabite citizen? What's the point of that? Well, here's the point. You see, the Moabites and the Israelites, they have a long, long, dicey, dramatic history. You see, Moab, he was the oldest son of this man named Lot, and Lot was the nephew of this man named Abraham. Abraham's family line, they eventually become the Israelites, and Moab's line, they become the Moabites. So the Israelites and the Moabites, they're actually family. But like many family stories, there's drama. Oh, and lots of drama. 
the two sides were involved in so many battles. And I'm not just talking about verbal spats like sometimes we have in the Thanksgiving meals. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, I'm talking about family members fighting and actually killing each other. Both sides experienced victory and defeat against their family foe. Look at Judges 3 and 1 Samuel 14. In fact, the the tension between these two families, it got so bad, it got so, so toxic and nasty that in Deuteronomy chapter 23, a decree had to be made that totally excluded the Moabites from engaging in Jewish community life. Could you imagine your family members saying, we took a vote, you are no longer allowed to come to Thanksgiving meals, okay? I mean, how bad does it have to get for that to happen? So, let's go back to Ruth now, all right? The woman from Moab, she decides she's going to go to Judah. That's kind of like ground zero of family drama. Ruth, she had to have known that she was about to enter somewhat of hostile territory, right? I mean, she had to have known by going to Judah, she was opening herself to potential harassment. Verbal harassment, physical harassment, ostracism, maybe even worse. I don't know. But Ruth put the compassionate care of Naomi over her own personal comfort. Friends, that's a mark of a servant leader. And there's more. In order to provide food for herself and her mother-in-law, Ruth decides to do this thing called Gleaning. Now, we have no idea what that is. It's so far removed from a modern culture, but gleaning was Israel's, basically, it was their welfare program. In Leviticus 19 and 23, God's law says that farmers were not permitted to harvest the corners, the corners of their fields, because that was to be reserved for the poor to harvest for themselves. And also the harvesters were said if they dropped any grain on the ground as they were harvesting, they were not allowed to pick it up. And they were to leave that for the poor to collect after, they had, after the harvesters left the field. Now, even though gleaning was part of God's law, Ruth knew not all landowners were, how do I say it? were very welcoming or enthusiastic to just anyone gleaning on their field. She knew that they were not so happy about some foreigners gleaning, especially, I don't know, a Moabite foreigner gleaning on their field. So Ruth decides to ask for permission to glean on the field before she does, knowing rejection was a possibility, right? Uh, One could see this as a very humiliating act, begging, pleading, maybe even groveling, asking, please help me. Yet, Ruth put compassionate care of Naomi over her own personal comfort. Now, gleaning had risks. If you look at verse 22, Naomi alluded to the potential danger of assaults while gleaning in the field. Look, a foreign woman all by herself in a large field, no friends, no family, nobody to watch her back, she was vulnerable to physical assault. Another Bible translation or another Bible uh, uh, um, yeah, translation says sexual assault. So again, Ruth put compassionate care of Naomi over her own personal comfort. So yeah, gleaning had risks, but also gleaning was hard work, man. Have you guys ever seen uh, videos of Black Friday shoppers at Walmart, like right when the door opens? It's insane, it's insane. Um, When the doors open, it looks literally like just a stampede, a horde of people just charging through the front doors of Walmart. People are literally walking over one another, stomping on each other. People are fighting over the very limited supplies of deeply discounted flat screen TVs. What is it about flat screen TVs that people go crazy about? I don't know. 
But listen, if you want to see the depths of man's depravity, of how awful we can be, go to Walmart on Black Friday. If you do, God be with you. <laughs> I mean, it's like survival of the fittest. And I imagine gleaning is kind of like that, right? There is a limited supply of grain to harvest, and there's a lot of people who are dependent on that limited supply of food to survive. So it had to have been very, very taxing work. So Ruth labors all day. She puts herself in potential harm's way to provide for another, for her mother-in-law, Naomi. Friends, servant leadership, they believe in the care of another. And number two, servant leaders believe in generosity to all. You know, when, when Boaz steps onto his field in verse number four, Ruth is already working his field. She already asked for permission. She got it, and she's already hard at work. Now, there must have been something, um, something about Ruth that Boaz notices her pretty quickly, and he inquires about who this woman is. Look at verse five and seven, right? And then he gets details about Ruth, and two of those details probably jumped out to him. One, this woman is from Moab. Again, remember, Moabites, they were not allowed to participate in Jewish community life. So Boaz probably, he could have kicked her out based just on that. And two, he finds out that this woman, Ruth, actually, she came into town with Naomi. Now, that name Naomi should have jumped out to Boaz because he is a relative of her late husband, Elimelech. And later in verse 11, we find out that Boaz has heard about all the good things that Ruth has done to care for Naomi after her husband died and her two sons had died. So here is this Moabite woman who is now part of his family. Now, as an owner of this land, Boaz, his only legal obligation to Ruth was to glean from his field. That's it. Nothing more, nothing less. That was his only legal obligation. But Boaz doesn't do just the bare minimum. He does so much more. He is incredibly generous to Ruth. One, he showed generosity by giving Ruth permission to enter into his community. Read verses 8 through 9 with me, if you would. Verse 8 says, Then Boaz said to Ruth, Now listen, my daughter, do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young woman. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. Remember, Moabites were not allowed to be part of Jewish community, but Boaz gave his blessing for her to join his female workers. And on top of that, he told his male workers to treat her with respect. He said, hey, hands off, leave her alone. So he had zero obligation to provide community. He had no obligation to provide protection for this foreigner, Moabite woman, but he did. And also, he showed generosity by providing abundantly for her physical needs. If you look at verse 8 and 9, normally what happens with gleaners is they will come into the main harvesting area after the harvesters had done their work for the day. And that's when the gleaners would pick up whatever was left on the ground from the harvesters. But Boaz... What he does is extra. He allowed Ruth to glean while his female workers were harvesting. What does that mean? He basically gave Ruth first dibs on what was left of the harvesting area. Now, as if that wasn't enough, in verse 9, whenever she was thirsty, uh, Boaz gave her permission to drink from the water that his men provided. Now, usually... Gleaners would have to stop working, walk to whatever well they're allowed to use, pull water from the well, drink it, and they'd have to go back to work. 
but Ruth didn't have to do that. Water was right there for her. Just imagine the time and the energy that Ruth saved because of the small act of kindness by Boaz. Now, as if that wasn't enough, verse 14, Boaz welcomes her to join him and his people to eat. Now, this, this is huge. I, 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 I think people just blow by this and not understanding the cultural implications of this. Um, Dave and John Ferguson, they wrote a really great book called Bless. And in that book, they break down very practical and very purposeful ways of living on mission with those people in your lives who are in your spheres of influence. And Ferguson says this about the power of inviting people to a meal. He says this. He says, inviting someone to eat is a statement of friendship. Ferguson said sharing a meal with someone is an affirmation of that person's value, dignity, and worth. So who you ate with indicated who you loved and considered to be part of your social class. Friends, Boaz's invitation to Ruth uh, to eat with them, he made it really clear. He made it clear to Ruth and he made it clear to all of the men and the women who are working in the field. Hey, listen, you see that woman, Ruth? She's no longer a foreigner to us. She's no longer a Moabite to us. She's no longer a hostile family foe to us. No, she's now a welcomed member of our community. And because Ruth was now a welcomed member of our community, Boaz just absolutely lavished her with so much more. He didn't skimp out on the food he gave her. He gave her abundantly. In fact, verse 15, it says she had so much food, she was full, and she had so much left over. And she took that leftovers and she brought it home to feed her mother-in-law, Naomi. And as if that wasn't enough, guys, look in verse 15 and 16. After she finished her meal, Ruth, being the diligent worker that she is, she goes back to the field to glean. And Boaz says this to his workers. Basically, he says this. Hey, guys, you, you know the, the sheaves that we collect? You know, the, that's the good stuff, right? That's the stuff that we usually keep away. We separate it from the gleaners. Yeah, that stuff. I want you to drop a bunch of those on the ground so that Ruth can get it. So she can glean it. Biblical scholars, they believe that Ruth took home so much grain that day that it equaled about half a month's wages. That's a lot. That's a lot. As if that wasn't enough. In verse 21, Boaz gave Ruth permission to glean in his field, not just that one time, but throughout the remainder of the harvesting season. That's huge. Uh, biblical scholars, they estimate that the remainder of the harvesting season was anywhere from a few weeks to a few months. Now, this was huge for two reasons. Ruth didn't have to worry about food for a long, long time. And two, Ruth didn't have to worry about her personal safety for a long, long time because Boaz promise protection for her. Guys, in, what kind of blows my mind about this is Ruth offered nothing to Boaz. She had no money. She had no social pull. She had no social influence. She had no political power or influence. Like She literally offered nothing to him. Yet, Boaz goes beyond the legal requirements to provide for her. He generously provided for her physically and emotionally. He gave her food. He gave her a new community, that, a sense of belonging. And he gave her protection, a sense of safety and security. See, friends, servant leaders believe in generosity to all. And the last point, number three, servant leaders point people to the perfect servant leader. 
You know, what's crazy about Ruth and Boaz as story friends is that they had no idea how pivotal a role their life will play in God's sovereign plan for humanity. They had no idea how their lives of servant leadership would serve actually as a north star that points to the one who would exemplify perfect servant leadership, Jesus. But they had no idea how this perfect servant leader would one day fulfill the prophecy from Isaiah chapter 53, verse 3 to 5. If you don't know it, let me read it to you. Isaiah 53, verse 3 says, He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. By his wounds, we are healed. Friends, because of Jesus' perfect servant leadership, He generously provided the most loving, the most merciful, the most gracious, and the most holy exchange. The most holy exchange with you and me. You see, Jesus exchanged his perfect, sinless, innocent, righteous standing, his status, for our sin-riddled, guilty, unrighteous status. You know what that means? It means because of this holy exchange by Jesus, our status in the eyes of God will forever be forgiven, redeemed, accepted, righteous, eternally secure, child, of God. Amen. Friends, that's the gospel. That's the gospel of our perfect servant leader, Jesus. So friends, as I close, my exhortation to you today is not, is not, hey, try harder. (laughs) Try harder to be more selfless. Hey, it's not work harder to be more generous. It's not, hey, just, just be a servant leader, right? Just, just do it. Just do it. As if that's ever been helpful advice to anyone. No. Friends, the, the, the life of Ruth, the life that Boaz lived, the life of serving others, I just want you to know, friends, that this is Jesus' desire for you and me. In John chapter 13, the Last Supper, Jesus washes his disciples' feet. He shows them what a servant leader looks like. And he said this, Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. Catch this. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Friends, we, we care for others like Ruth and Boaz, we show generosity to all like Ruth and Boaz we, so that we could point people to the perfect Ruth, so that we can point people to the perfect Boaz. That's Jesus. Church, may our, may our lives serve as a north star, directing people straight to the perfect servant. Jesus. Amen. So here is my million dollar question to you today. Do you want that? Do you want to live a servant life? A life that serves and cares for the needs of others. A life that is generous to all. And a life that points people to Jesus. If your answer is yes, then this is my exhortation to you. Draw near to Jesus. You see, 
the more time you spend with Jesus, your life just can't help but change. The way you see people changes. The way you feel about people changes. Um, a respected Christian leader who I've been following, uh, she recently posted this on her social media account. She said this, Sitting with Jesus is where holy trades are made. Your reputation for his favor. Your expectations for his peace. Your jealousy for his freedom. Your control for his blessing. Your standards for his wisdom. Your addictions for his joy. Your ambitions for his calling. And I'll add one more thing. Your self-centered, self-serving heart for his servant heart. Friends, as you draw near to Jesus, would you ask him, who are you calling me? To serve? Who are you calling me to bless generously? And who are you calling me to point to you? Jeremiah is going to lead us in one more song. Draw near to Jesus. Worship him. Let's do that together now. I will not be shy. 
shaking holy there is no one like you there is none beside you but you open up my eyes in wonder show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me oh I upon your love it is a firm foundation and I will put my trust in you alone and I will not be shaken oh, I will build my life upon your love it is a firm foundation and I will put my trust in you alone and I will not